This video is done in collaboration with Henry the Paleo Guy, ATR1X underscore, Curious Archive, Spino Dude Reviews, and Some Raptor. Check out their channels via links in the description and comment section below. Low poly models in this video were made by Adam Midzuk or Kuzim. They were animated by Cameron, Camzilla94, and by Nyx. Sauropods, or long necks, were the largest things to ever walk the face of the earth. Nothing else has come close. Whether that's because something evolves to curb them before they reach the same size as the long neck dinosaurs, or that the sauropods were just built different, the fact remains that nothing existed before or after them that could compete. The only critters to beat out the land titans are the oceanic leviathans, but that's water, they're cheating. Each new sauropod dinosaur discovered helps to understand the group as a whole, as every single one is fragmentary, with very few considered relatively complete. One of these well-preserved behemoths was yet another South American beast from the late Cretaceous. Come and join me in learning about one of the most complete of the titanosaurs, Dreadnoughtus, the living citadel. Fossils come in all shapes, sizes, preservations, colors, and more. Some of the rarest among the fossil types, aside from gem quality specimens, are those which preserved impressions or replaced soft tissues. Dino mummies are the best example here, but there are also plenty of other animals found with their soft tissues preserved. However, these fossils preserve little to no percentage of the original organic material that was once in those soft tissues. There exists a secret type of fossil that also preserves soft tissues, but not in the same way as the more well-known type. These fossils often do not preserve impressions or replacements of soft tissues, but do preserve bits of the original organic tissues. Most of the time, these tissues are preserved within super hard bones, like leg bones. Sometimes this is not the case, but that is rare. As such, the idea of exceptional preservation has evolved over the last several decades to encompass fossils that maintain part of their original organic composition, as well as specimens that retain delicate morphological characteristics through processes such as phosphatization. There are now plenty of techniques fossil workers use to analyze fossils to see if they contain these itty bitty fragments of organics like amino acid analyses, Raman spectroscopy, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, immunology, time of flight secondary ion mass spectrometry, and tandem mass spectrometry. But of course, the techniques are not limited to this list. Despite the impending rise of the body of evidence for original internal organic material surviving millions of years, these findings have been met with skepticism, most of the time well-placed skepticism. Most of that skepticism seems to come from the thought that we do not yet fully understand the geochemical mechanisms which might allow for such preservation. In other words, some researchers caution skepticism towards these tissues as they may not represent entirely what they seem to. They may not be literally the exact same organic material that used to be in the given structure, though there are some proposed hypotheses that seem to suggest that there truly are some geochemical factors that may positively influence preservation, like iron involvement, microbial activity, and or condensation reactions, these studies often only look at specific cases in isolation, rather than whole skeletons, animals, ecosystems, and such. 
This makes it a tad difficult to infer larger scale relationships between the geochemical environment and preservation. As a result, most paleomolecular studies lack extensive depositional and geochemical data that may contribute to developing credible, multifaceted theories concerning molecular preservation in deep time. In other words, it's complicated, guys. Plenty of the studies and fossils are promising, and plenty likely do represent some form of soft tissue, but plenty researchers just want to be cautious about overreaching until tech advances, new techniques are devised, more interdisciplinary research is done, more specimens are found, and things can be more solidly proven one way or another. Which brings us to old Dreadnoughtus, the living dreadnought of Argentina. Two specimens of Dreadnoughtus are known, one big, one small. The larger of the two, the holotype, and the most complete, is given the designation MPM PV 1156. This specimen allows for detailed examination of the way in which it was preserved, the way its body was buried, how the bones decomposed before that, and how it changed from bone to inorganic minerals. The original descriptors, Dr. Kenneth Lacovera, and a list of 16 other researchers hypothesized that the body of the big boy was entombed during a quick burial event, like that of a crevasse splay. This hypothesis was based on the extraordinary completeness of the skeleton and evidence of deformation of the rock and sediment layers it was buried in at the time it was buried. Rapid burial tends to be an important first step for pretty much every single fossil specimen that preserves any kind of soft tissue. Considering how well preserved the remains of this dinosaur were, at the macroscopic level, the new team, including the likes of Dr. Elena Schroeter, Dr. Paul V. Ullman, Kyle McCulley, Dr. Richard Ash, Wenxia Zhang, Dr. Mary Schweitzer, and Dr. Kenneth Lacovera have hypothesized that the initial swift burial event that protected the skeleton may have protected some of the internal microscopic structures as well, potentially even original proteins. In the new study, the team gave a few things a thorough once over. The geologic background of the sauropod skeleton, like the rock layers and sediments that make those layers, as well as the way in which each part of the dinosaur's body was messed with after death, how each part was deposited, how each part was buried, and turned into minerals. After that, the team took it into the micro scale. They examined the animal's left humerus under the microscope to see how it was preserved and buried on the inside. The steps the team took to do all of this includes histological analysis and x-ray diffraction to assess the structural integrity of the bone microstructure and the extent of its internal mineral content, laser ablation inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry to assess its geochemical history based on the spatial heterogeneity of rare earth elements and other pertinent trace elements throughout the bone cortex. Chemical demineralization and optical microscopy of bone tissue to assess the morphological preservation of soft tissue microstructures and in situ and in solution immunological assays to assess the presence of internal proteins. With all those annoyingly academic words out of the way, now we must briefly explore the stratigraphy, geology, and taphonomy of the specimen. I may have touched on some of this at some point, so I will do my best to summarize. Both specimens of Dreadnoughtus were recovered from outcrops of the late Cretaceous Cerro Fortaleza formation along the east bank of the Rio La Leona in Santa Cruz Province, Argentina back in 2005 till 2008. Based on the earlier recovery of Campanian-aged ammonites from the underlying La Anita formation and Maastrichtian pollen grains and spores from the overlying La Irina formation, Dr. Kenneth Lacovera and friends estimated its age to be Campanian to Maastrichtian. Recent radiometric dating of Cerro Fortaleza formation, detrital zircons, and the Dreadnoughtus quarry limits the date of these deposits to the Campanian, so about 83.6 to 72.1 million years ago. The layers of the Cerro Fortaleza formation are made up of fluvial, or river, and overbank rocks. 
These rocks were deposited in the Austral Basin, which happens to now be east of the southern Patagonian Andes. The long neck remains were uncovered from rocks that were made of tan, finely trough cross bedded, fine to medium grained sandstone, and gray homogeneous mudstone containing abundant plant remains. That first rock type looks like this, while the gray stuff looks a little bit like this. These rocks are represented as crevasse splay, which was splooged out onto a river fed floodplain. The waves in the rocks tell you that there was some water movement of the sediment, which may have been the power needed to bury the whole dino skeletons. Now, we move into the sample collection portion of this project. The team took fragments of the bone from the center of the humerus. They also took samples of the sediment around the bones immediately after they took the plaster jackets off. They were placed in a glass container and dried and left until this new team got the time to study it. Then they took another bone fragment from the mid shaft of a long bone for a rare earth element analysis. The bone would go on to be sectioned into slices and embedded in resin. The team made sure to gather some control samples too. In this case, they used sections of bones from a chicken and an American alligator. Histology Histology, as I have gone over many times on this channel, is the study of microscopic tissues. I really need to get to a video going through this fascinating field and technique. Anyways, the practice can look at any and all tissues. Skin, airways, organ surfaces, reproductive and digestive tracts, tendons, bone, blood, ligament, fat, areolar, muscles, organs, and all that kind of good squishy stuff. Most of the techniques here were invented based on living tissues, but can and have recently and increasingly been used to analyze the tissues of extinct fossil organisms. So, for Dreadnoughtus, the team took their bone fragments and embedded it in resin. Then they took a wafer saw and sliced up some delicious 2mm thick sections. Next, the team took those sections and mounted them to a glass slide with epoxy and ground and polished the thin section's fossil side to transparency. Finally, the sections were imaged with a transmitted light microscope that was fitted with circularly polarized light filters and a motorized XYZ stage. It was also set up to take automated image montages of the sections. X-ray diffraction Next up was X-ray stuff. The team took some of the bone fragments and powdered them in tungsten carbide mixer mill, which I assume means they ground the specimen into powder to a scale of about 10 microns. Then they took the powder into an expert diffractometer and then diffracted some x-rays into the powder to get an idea of the kinds of elements or rare earth elements present in the bones. Then they used laser ablation inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry to shoot lasers and get back information on elements and such. Demineralization The team then took bits from the dinosaur humerus and incubated them in a chemical mixture called disodium ethylene diamine tetra ethylene diamine ethylene diamine tetra acetic acid Blech. too many vowels it does go by eta for short they left the bone in the mixture for two weeks anything that remained after that bath was moved to a glass slide and doused in acetone to remove any glues and stuff after that, the whole thing was imaged in transmitted light and cross-polarized light under the microscope. Immunofluorescence Another assay thrown at the bony bits was immunofluorescence. The team took demineralized tissues from the dinosaur, the chicken, and the alligator and embedded them in resin, sectioned them out into 220 micron slides, and then subjected them to immunofluorescence assays. This technique is complex and is different according to what is being studied, but here they used polyclonal rabbit anti-chicken collagen 1 antibodies to get antigens and fluorescent dyes to light up. It helps to show where certain tissues are and whether they are present. Enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay When I said this study was dense, I meant it. 
The next thing the teeth did was enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or ELISA tests. They took bone and sediment fragments, removed any mineral contents with hydrochloric acid, solubilized any proteins present with another chemical called guanidine hydrochloride, then, of course, included some control samples with the mixture but no material. They extracted any proteins that were present. Results Now, we get to take a look at what the team found by going through all these tests. First up is the histology. Here's an image of one of those slices on a slide. The team wrote that the bone shows primary fibrolamellar bone at the periosteal surface transitioning to densely remodeled secondary bone deeper at the medullary cavity. This is the kind of bone found in fast-growing, high-metabolism animals as well as large dinosaurs. This matches the identification of this dinosaur as not fully grown. The team did not find any evidence of tunneling through the bone by fungus. This means the bone did not undergo much of any microbial decay. The X-ray diffraction analysis was done on the bones to see if the original minerals were replaced over time after fossilization. Their results found four major minerals, dolomite and three types of apatite. They technically found that the bone was about 5% calcite dolomite and 95% apatite. This reflects a very minimal replacement of the OG skeletal material by outside minerals. They found the rare earth elements captured in the bone were mostly just manganese and strontium, with minor concentrations of yttrium, scandium, uranium, and iron. They found that the rare earth elements were most concentrated on the outside of the bone and sharply decreased further towards the center. No shock there. Soft Tissues So what did the team find out about the soft tissues preserved in the bones after all those experiments had been conducted? They found that the demineralized bone from the center of the leg bone contained what appeared to be soft, flexible structures, similar in shape to vasculature, the fibrous, collagenous matrix of bone, and osteocytes. Vessels were discovered developing immediately from the fossil tissue as well as in solution after demineralization and EDTA acid. Isolated samples of these hollow, flexible tubes did not disintegrate after several acid Acetone treatments, ruling out the possibility that they are cast created by the infilling of acetone-soluble glues and or field consolidates. The tapering bifurcation pattern seen in living animal arteries and reported soft tissues from other ancient vertebrates was also seen in recovered vessels of Dreadnoughtus. The vessels seen in the dinosaur's bones can be ruled out as the hyphae of fungus as they are completely different in form. Hyphae are an order of magnitude smaller in size than the structures observed in the dino bone. Regardless of stage orientation, vasculature showed minimal birefringence when scanned with cross-polarized light. The only birefringence seen was in small, isolated spots along the vessel wall, leaving the remainder of the structure black. Birefringence just being the way a mineral will reflect light and shine back to different colors of light depending on the angle you are looking at it and the angle at which it is under the microscope. Because most minerals are anisotropic and exhibit birefringence under cross-polarized light, the lack of birefringence in these structures, as well as their pliability, are characteristics more compatible with an organic, amorphous substance than a mineralized cast. In other words, these things are the real deal, not a mineral replacement. The matrix retrieved from the dreadnought's bones was soft, flexible, and fibrous, with encapsulated, elongated osteocytes arranged parallel to one another. Osteocytes are simply bone-producing cells, for those wondering. In general, these osteocytes have shorter, blunted, philopodia-like features as compared to probable osteocytes from other extinct animals. It is unknown if this is due to tissue degeneration between the fossil's exhumation and analysis, or if it is an artifact of preservation produced by the unique depositional environment in which the specimen was entombed. Regardless, the team was able to recover specimens of these elongated structures with the characteristic philopodia-like extensions of extant osteocytes. 
Isolated osteocytes, like vasculature, did not disintegrate in acetone and showed very little birefringence when viewed under cross-polarized light, ruling out their origin as glue or mineral infill of osteocytes. Immunofluorescence Results So, a lot of this has to do with biology, chemistry, and medicine-esque terminology, so I don't entirely understand the ins and outs of it. I don't think we totally need to in order to get an understanding of what the team did and what they found. They found that the thin sections of chicken and gator bones fluoresced as they should. They used chicken antibodies and dyes to get parts of the bone to fluoresce, so it makes sense both would light up. They are relatives. The chicken bones lit up stronger than the gator bones, which is expected. Since sauropods are related to both crocs and birds and are bracketed by them in an evolutionary context, its bones should work with the antibodies the team used. Turns out that was correct, and the dreadnoughtus bones lit up. Though in the dinosaur, the bones fluoresced the most dimly among all samples. To make sure this fluorescence wasn't because of a list of other possible factors, the team did some other tests and controls and found that it could be ruled out that the collagens they were seeing were because of other factors. In other words, they showed again and again that what they were getting was really organic stuff from the dino's bones. So, for all intents and purposes, the dreadnoughtus humerus seems to preserve original what is called early diagenetic signatures, which have not been meaningfully destroyed by later diagenetic processes. Diagenesis being the process by which sediment becomes rock or bone becomes fossil. The immunological tests and immunofluorescent assays all show that it really is collagen that has been preserved within the bone. A surprising element to the dreadnoughtus tissues is that the bones of dreadnoughtus are more fossilized, you know, your average fossilization seen in most dinosaur fossils, and yet you still find preserved collagen. Most other fossils in which collagen has been found are those that have undergone very little alteration after burial. The other thing the team found that other paleomolecular researchers should think about moving forward is to include more extensive geochemical analyses as part of the routine molecular testing methods. Only more data and more deep comprehensive data will allow for a better and more complex understanding of how sediment and bone become mineral and rock. And no, the soft tissues did not preserve DNA. And no, we cannot resurrect a real, genuine, non-avian dinosaur, so don't ask. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my elephant tier patrons Arda Bayer, Biotiverse, Christoph Hubbinger, Dinosaur, Isaiah Garza, PA Brew News, Ray, Rudy Redgrave, Smiling Walrus. And another thanks to my Tyrannosaurus tier patrons Iberospinus, Iron Bladesman, Swaffles is Weird, Teeny Dragator, The Dogman, 